Thank you everyone for uh, patiently waiting. The webinar will start shortly. Uh, just give us a two more minutes while we wait for more participants to come in. All right, so it looks like we're at the top of the hour. So I um, will start. Um, well, thank you all for attending our webinar centering on AI in the classroom opportunities and challenges. Before we begin, I will give you a brief overview of Lumen in today's webinar um, before enter introducing our moderator, Michael Babcock. Uh, our mission at Lumen is to enable unprecedented learning for all students, and we continue to build on that mission with webinars centered on student and faculty success. Lumen got its start as part of a series of grant projects funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation focused on improving all learners' success by helping faculty adopt open content and use it effectively. Today, everything we do focuses on making the learning experience highly effective for students, especially students from high, historically marginalized and resistant, ba resilient backgrounds. Today, we have impacted over 1.6 million students with our courseware and have over 1,000 faculty that have taken our fac faculty professional development offerings. Here at Lumen, we use a complementary two-part approach to, improve, to improving student success, which is why we refer to ourselves as a true teaching and learning company. Our digital courseware, Waymaker and Ohm, focus on general education courses. Waymaker and Ohm provide students with course materials that support learning by including consistent opportunities for interactivity, learning by doing, strong attention to accessibility, and frequent data-driven improvements. And we support faculty through our evidence-based professional development program, Lumen Circles, which is designed to help instructors become more effective and impactful in their teaching, regardless of whether they use Lumen's courseware. Helping to power this conversation, we have our wonderful facilitators from Lumen Circles that help us to create this, um, these opportunities and provide professional development um, to, our, um, to our educators. Thank you for joining us for this webinar and we welcome questions in the Q&A function. And now I'm going to introduce um, Michael Babcock who will lead the conversation. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Angelica. It's really uh, a privilege to be with you right now uh, talking about this topic that's pretty much captured our imagination and uh, been the subject of a lot of discussion over the last uh, couple of months. And obviously, uh, I'm not introducing chat GP2, uh, T to you. It's uh, something that we have become familiar with, whether we like it or not. And what we're really trying to do now is grapple with what, what's the impact of that? Uh, how will it change uh, what we do in the classroom? How can we be proactive in that process? What kinds of things will we need to bring to our lesson design in order to uh, facilitate deeper learning uh, with this kind of technology out there being accessed and used by our students. These will be the kinds of things that we want to talk about, I hope in a very practical way, uh, over the next uh, uh, hour uh, with you today. I'm just looking at all of the individuals logging in and uh, into the chat and everything, and I'm really happy to see uh, the wide distribution across the country. Uh, uh, my eye is particularly caught uh, 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 focuses in, I should say, on the community colleges that I see represented. I teach at a community college myself. I teach English. And uh, it's a, a tremendous mission, I think, to bring higher education to uh, as many as possible. And so this is a valuable topic, an important topic, and one that really highlights the importance of active learning in the classroom. In addition to uh, teaching English, I am a Lumen facilitator, and uh, it's one of the things I really enjoy doing because it allows me to interact with colleagues around the country as we seek to reflect upon and improve our uh, instruction. And, uh, and so this really is growing out of that passion that I have for that. And uh, once again, thank you for joining us for this today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I want to launch into the presentation as quickly as we can, as expeditiously as we can. And let me see here if I can't get that going right there. 
take a moment or so to load AI in the classroom challenges and opportunities. Let's uh, quickly just look at the subtitle, Challenges and Opportunities. What is it a challenge to? Well, I, as I was thinking over this, it occurred to me, I'm a, I teach in the humanities. And so uh, I think clearly humanities courses are, are particularly in the bullseye, just given the nature of text generation and, and how this software works, but not exclusively. We're gonna also be talking about the impact upon STEM uh, a little bit later in our discussion. Uh, as an English professor, I'm acutely aware that writing intensive courses, such as English composition, are very much impacted by this technology. But also, I think, online courses. And increasingly, this is uh, what we are teaching as faculty. And uh, that, that distance that is built into that structure can make it more challenging for us to constructively uh, work uh, in an environment that has these technologies that can often undermine the various things we're trying to do. I want us, though, to think in positive terms, though, that this isn't just a matter of challenges. It's also a matter of opportunities. I, I, when the news broke two months ago, I mean, I remember just how apocalyptic the language was. And you, you'd think the barbarians were at the gates or something, right? This is the fall of Rome. And, uh, you know, the college essay is dead is what one uh, uh, very hyperventilating essay uh, had as its title. And uh, in, in a little while, you know, one of my colleagues, Derek, will be addressing that and hopefully dialing us back a little bit from that, from that kind of panic mode. And I think two months into this now, uh, that 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 anxiety, I wouldn't say it's dissipating, but I think it's becoming a little bit more balanced that this really does present some opportunities to undertake, for example, meaningful course redesign. It takes a lot of work to do that, but sometimes we need the, the motivation to do that. And I think this is a golden opportunity for us to look at what we're doing. How are we designing our classes, our lessons, our courses? Are we doing it with active principles, evidence-based active teaching principles in mind that will frustrate the ability of an AI platform to, uh, to operate effectively? Um, are we taking the opportunity to model the positive use of technology. You know, the ostrich approach just makes no sense whatsoever because this technology is the future. We know that. We've been hearing that, right? But in every area, the business world, at home, but in the classroom as well. Students that we train will go out into a workforce that will be driven by, by AI in many ways. And so we, we must grapple with this in ways that are leaning into the technology in a positive way, what I call a, a technology positive approach. And then finally, I've alluded to also the opportunity we have to rethink the very basic way that we teach within our classrooms. And this kind of relates to meaningful course redesign, but more specifically, as it relates to active learning techniques, uh, learning by doing, getting students involved in the process as co-creators of knowledge. And, and we'll talk about that uh, as well as this progresses. Let me quickly uh, present three framing quotes that kind of uh, present different dimensions of this issue that I'd like for us to think about. The first one uh, was written by Ian Bogost, who's a writer I very much admire. He writes frequently for the Atlantic. He writes on technology topics. And uh, in his analysis, which I thought was very astute of ChatGPT, he, uh, he says the following. You may find comfort in knowing that the bot's output, while fluent and persuasive as text, is consistently uninteresting as prose. It's formulaic in structure, style, and content. I'm highlighting that key idea. And that is because the basic essay format is essentially an algorithmic form of the five paragraph essay that is taught as standard fare in high school English classes and what our students bring into college composition classes. Now, I would beg to differ with Ian Bogost. I don't find any comfort in that at all, because uh, that uh, kind of an output would be more than acceptable for many of the kinds of writing assignments in many different classes. Not to mention, it seems that if we are setting a standard of, you know, is this an A-plus product that ChatGPT is, is giving us, and we say, no, it's not, it's more like a C product, uh, if, if we take comfort in that, once again, we're missing the point because 
unfortunately, many of our students are perfectly fine with getting the passing grade, getting the C and moving on to, a, to the next required course. This may be enough for them. I think we need to keep in mind that students using an economic term are rational actors. And we've got to, we've got to recognize that they are going to use resources they will be uh, incentivized to use resources that they perceive to be in their best interest to use. That's why it's so important for us to upfront design what we're doing in the classroom in such a way as to not facilitate that uh, process. Here's my second quote. It is only through direct engagement with these emerging AI tools that students will gain familiarity uh, with a purposeful integration into their writing processes and an awareness of the ethical challenges of engaging AI in their writing. Uh, again, uh, my colleague Derek will speak a little bit more completely to this in a moment, but let me just highlight some of the key takeaways. Purposeful integration. The intentionality that we bring to what we do as teachers is so important. It's so easy for us to get you know, into that autopilot zone, especially if you've been teaching for a while, right? And you walk into a classroom with maybe minimal preparation because you've taught this before. And, and on the one hand, that's a kind of a comfortable place to be. But on the other hand, it's a dangerous place to be, not just because of AI, but because we want to constantly self-reflect on what we are doing as educators. That's what excites me so much about Lumen Circles and why I so much enjoy uh, working as a facilitator and getting to know uh, colleagues around the country as we in a circle, uh, a community of practice, examine closely what we're doing and explore ways that we can mix it up and vary that and, and, and improve the outcomes. And so this quote really goes to the heart of that. Uh, and, and so again, we'll be addressing that a little bit later in the presentation more fully. Here's my third quote. Assessing only a completed product is no longer viable. Assessment needs to shift to process. This has always been the case, but ChatGPT is forcing the issue. Scaffolding and the skills and competencies associated with writing, producing, and creating is the way forward. Again, this is good, sound, pedagogical advice applicable across the spectrum of disciplines, very highly specific to the field I teach in, which is writing intensive. But in any setting, we should be constantly thinking about how are we, how are we embedding activities within a process of learning that, that builds from one to the next in ever increasing levels of skill? And then are we assessing that process? So there's not just a kind of a, a one-off drop dead high stakes assignment at the end. That more than anything raises the stakes and incentivizes uh, using these kinds of tools. Uh, but it becomes much more difficult to use them if the process itself uh, becomes the focal point or the point of emphasis in the assessment. Let me just uh, give you some test cases and just describe these a little bit, and then we'll drill into a couple of these more closely that I first kicked around in December, early December, when the buzz started with ChatGPT. And, uh, and I'm sure that many of you, if not most of you, have, have done this as well, taking your own prompts, taking your own assignments and activities, plugging them into the, into the platform and seeing what it kicks out. I did that with essay questions from online courses in comparative mythology and American literature. I was absolutely blown away with the way I had, you know, taking the prompts that I had written and embedded in my online courses, and then just imagining that I'm in a, in a student's position how uh, I could have actually uh, gotten a very good score in my class on some of these essay questions uh, through this technology. And, uh, and that right there was a wake up call for me. Secondly, I tooled around a little bit uh, with how would you build a more complicated piece of writing, a multi-page argument essay. And it's something that was, it's, it, it takes a little bit more skill, a little more savvy, uh, and, and, uh, but nonetheless, you can do that. You can certainly generate significant parts of that. And the one thing that uh, ChatGPT does not do is it doesn't do research. And so that's one of the Achilles heels from a, from a student uh, writing perspective, if you're looking at it from that vantage point. Secondly, the, or the third and the fourth ones are the ones I want to drill into just a little bit over the next few moments with you. Uh, the third case study here were two non-traditional writing assignments that I pulled out of my world literature class and my American literature class. They really illustrate the creative dimensions of ChatGPT. This blew my socks off more than anything else that I found because I had always thought 
And that, that, that these assignments, these creative prompts that ask my students to, to actively do things with, you know, using tools and so on, um, were, were almost plagiarism proof or almost cheating proof. And then came chat GPT and completely changed my thinking on that. And I'll, I'll show you some examples and we'll talk about that momentarily. Finally, an essay question that I found acted kind of like a silver bullet for me. And I hadn't intended that, but it did. An essay question on Henry James, iconic 19th century American writer. And it really exposed the limitations of chat GPT. And from that, I extrapolated some principles of what we can do to our prompts to not maybe cheat proof them, but to make it more difficult and to make it less attractive to use these technologies uh, for the completion of work. Well, let's go through these here for just a couple of moments. And again, I'm keeping my eye on the time so that we can make sure that we pass it off to Derek and Nicole as well. Here's the first prompt that was a creative uh, assignment that I asked my students. I asked them to write a letter to imagine that they were the 19th, the, the uh, 17th century American Puritan poet, uh, Anne Bradstreet, widely acknowledged as the first uh, significant American poet, uh, came over on the Arbella in 1630 and uh, uh, with uh, Governor uh, Winthrop. And so I asked, I asked my students then to imaginatively do the following, to write a letter late in her life to John Winthrop, challenging his conservative views about women who write. And we happen to know as a Puritan male in the 17th century, we have documentary evidence of this as well, that he, he thought that women really had no business in writing. And Bradstreet on the other hand, was a very gifted and talented writer who pushed the boundaries of, of what was expected of her within that traditional society. So I thought this was a really creative setup for a student to kind of channel Anne Bradstreet in, in response. And this is what it generated. Let's see if I can go ahead and click on it there. The generated text that I got was as follows. I've highlighted governor because the first thing I noted was that I didn't put governor in the prompt. I just said John Winthrop, but it was savvy enough to change that in the salutation, which would be appropriate, right? and, and uh, take his historical title. And you can just scan over that. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. It's a very literate and, and um, I think substantive uh, letter and I, I would have assessed it very favorably. Now, the one thing I did note, one, one among many things I noted, it didn't really sound like a 17th century Puritan woman to me. And so I began to play around a little bit more with the prompt. And you can do this. If you've played around with it, you know what I'm talking about. You can then ask a follow-up question and keep revising it. Can you make this sound more like a Puritan writing in the 17th century? And it, it obliged. You know, phrases like with a heavy heart and such pursuits are not fit for our sex and so on. I wanted to take it one step further. Can you add an example from Bradstreet's poetry? Because obviously I want to assess what my students are taking from the things that we're actually reading and talking about in the class. And true to form, allow me to share with you an example from my own poetry that illustrates the unique perspective and talents of women. Uh, in the poem, the prologue, I wrote, for if we wounds received by love or hate, a wound is all one, be it soon or late. This is the one essential, um, always anthologized poem by Anne Bradstreet. So it was a perfect choice for chat GPT to include this. Uh, in this in this regard. I had one more thing I wanted chat GPT to do. Can you now change the pronoun you to thee and thou? Let's make it a little more authentic. And it had no problem doing that in a split second. It started, in fact, it started writing immediately. I write to thee today with a heavy heart and I must challenge thy view. I noted it well, as well that it changed the verbs accordingly. I cannot sit idly by as thou claimest that such pursuits are not fit for our sex. Needless to say, I was deeply impressed by that, but also a little bit crestfallen, right? That my my creative activity that I thought would be really hard to just go online and, you know, find this and, uh, uh, you know, already uh, prefab and pre, you know, pre-made for them to download and use. Instead, ChatGPT was able to, in a very nimble way, work with my prompts and give me something that actually would have received a very good score uh, for that assignment. Here's a second from my world literature class, a second creative prompt that I uh, tested. Uh, in this class, I teach um, uh, 
in this particular section of it, I taught uh, Hamlet by William Shakespeare, and I taught a, no, a Japanese no play, Atsumori, by Ziami Motokiyo. Both of these plays feature ghosts in prominent ways. And so that became the entry point for this activity. And there's actually a, uh, an app online. It's really cool. It's a fake app, basically, where you can create and generate like a screenshot of a fake text conversation. And I modeled that in class, and then I gave them the prompt. And they had so much fun with that. It was a really meaningful learning activity uh, as they worked with that. Um, but ChatGPT was able to do something comparable, as you're going to see. My, my prompt was uh, discuss different approaches to using ghosts in their plays. The dialogue should have about 18 to 20 exchanges and uh, be written in a slangy style using texting shorthand. Well, this is what it gave me. William Shakespeare, yo, Ziami, what's good? And Ziami, not much, just working on this new play. How about you? Same, working on a little thing called Hamlet. Oh, snap, I've heard of that one. Ghost plays a pretty big role, right? I mean, this, is, this is mimicking. It's channeling exactly what my students were giving me. You know, that same kind of vibe, that same kind of style. And uh, you can read down and see how it, how it goes on for many more lines. But again, all of that in just a handful of seconds is actually generating that on screen moments after I enter the prompt. Sobering moment for me, right? And uh, definitely a, a proverbial wake-up call. Let me take you now to a little bit uh, of a brighter point, I guess, and what my explorations uh, took me to. And that is uh, in my American Lit class, uh, reading uh, one of the classic works of 19th century American literature is the, is the novella Daisy Miller by Henry James, published in the 1880s. It's a time when women are in American society are beginning to uh, become more uh, active. Uh, it's the early beginning of uh, women's rights movements in many ways, and the, the American economy is changing. So it's very, very much a transformational time. And Henry James is capturing that in this in this portrait of, of Daisy Miller, who's a, just a very kind of free thinking, uh, um, boundary breaking kind of a, a young woman. And I, I, reading this, I paired this, when I teach this, I pair this with a short story, The Trial by Fire by Bertha Allen, whom I'm guessing nobody has heard of, including myself before I dug it out of an obscure 1880s women's magazine. I was intentionally doing that. I wanted to see what were you know, women actually reading. This is this tremendous rise in literacy uh, during this period. Well, not so much literacy, but just a, just a desire to have things to read, right? A tremendous appetite in a market for, for reading uh, in, in this period after the Civil War. And so women's magazines were flourishing. And I found this particular one. I, I, I was drawn to it because it was a very traditional portrait of a housewife named Maggie very traditional. Uh, she lives uh, in a devoted way to her husband, in a sacrificial way to her husband, and that's really what the trial by fire is alluding to. Everything ends out fine in the end, and it's a happy marriage, uh, the end. And it, it affirms social values and traditional uh, conservative values at that time. Very different from this, as I said, this mold-breaking Daisy Miller, who's a kind of a new woman, that Henry James gives us. It was a, it's, a, it's a wonderful contrast, right? And so I wanted my students to, in a short essay, identify and briefly explain two or three key differences between Maggie and the Trial by Fire and Bertha Allen uh, by Bertha Allen and Daisy Miller by Henry James. And this was an essay question in an online course. And um, let me just show you what it came up with. Without even pausing, again, it just starts generating an answer. Look at the second paragraph. One key difference is their social status and background. Maggie is a poor, working-class woman who is struggling to make a living and support her family. Not true. Look at the fourth paragraph. Maggie is often seen as unconventional and even transgressive due to her independence and determination to succeed. Not true again. ChatGPT had no idea who Maggie was in The Trial by Fire by Bertha Allen. It was that obscure. That was a light bulb for me in terms of how to design uh, lessons and, and uh, assessments and so on. I, I didn't design it with that in mind. I designed it because I thought it was a really cool way to kind of compare what we call high literature and lowbrow literature many times, right? Popular literature and, and, and literature literature, as it were. And that was where I was coming from. 
I just kind of backed into this and stumbled into this, that this really exposed a weakness with what chat GPT is capable of doing. Now, here's the thing. Here's what really struck me. Uh, nothing prevented chat GPT from just producing fluent prose that was absolutely wrong. And I would see this and I would recognize it. No, this was not generated by a student who read this. Uh, this was generated some, and obviously it would be assessed accordingly. Uh, the content speaks for itself, right? But chat GPT went on its merry way, speaking and writing authoritatively as the text appeared on my screen. And here's the phrase that I kind of generated to describe one of the central problems I find with, with AI technology for text generation in contexts like this. And that is, it, it writes with what I call unwarranted authority, unwarranted authority. Obviously unwarranted in the sense that it doesn't have a right to the authority that it's claiming because it's all driven by algorithm. It's not coming from actual knowledge and it's unwarranted in that sense. And yet it is amazingly impressive. And because it's impressive, we, we impute to it a level and a degree of authority that it does not have. I think certainly students would do that. But I think a lot of us just tooling around with this have made that mistake as well. All right, let me take you now to the next slide. Those are just a couple of takeaways from those uh, prompts that I had entered in. I'm going to put these up on screen here one at a time. Attributes of effective prompts uh, that I sort of uh, inferred from that process. Number one, make them current. Chat GPT performs best when it can draw from a deep corpus of material that has been trained on, something not possible with examples that are highly current, things that occurred within the last year. I mean, Chat GPT, I, I believe uh, it, its databases, its corpus and so on, uh, doesn't start, it doesn't, uh, ends in 2020, I believe. And so there's, a, or 2021, there's a lag time there. And so the question is, can you relate content to contemporary case studies, something maybe that you pull out of the headlines today? Um, you know, like, like me, you're probably you know, looking for links on the various pages you open up in the morning and so on for maybe headlines that are interesting, that are related to what you're teaching. And I try to do that now with more urgency, basically, right? Because that's one way to AI-proof uh, your, your learning activity. And so they, they don't already have a large data footprint, which takes me to the second point, which overlaps just a little bit here, but gives a little different dimension or flavor to what I'm emphasizing here. That level of obscurity that I found with that story by Bertha Allen was, again, a real eye-opener for me. Keep in mind that general education courses, which probably most of us teach uh, in the main, I would say, are particularly vulnerable to generic prompts that draw from consensus knowledge. That's the strength of the corpus off which ChatGPT is drawing. Therefore, knowing that, we need to design prompts that don't that, that are not easily uh, answerable uh, on those terms. So my question is, can you identify an unusual angle on a familiar topic? In a gen ed course, you still have to you have to teach that consensus knowledge. What's the state of the knowledge in this introductory survey class, right? That's the whole foundational point of that. But in the way that you teach it, you can pair that with something like I did with Henry James, pair it with something. The reason why it was able to give such good answers on Henry James, and it nailed that, by the way, I didn't focus on that. It nailed that because Henry James has an enormous footprint online, right? But not so much for Bertha Allen. Can you anchor your prompt in highly specific details that assess depth of knowledge and not merely breadth of exposure? That's another key idea, Br uh, depth of knowledge, depth of analysis is a particular weakness of chat GPT. The more you read it and play with it, the glibber it sounds, right? It's very fluent, it's very glib, but not always a lot of depth beneath the fluency. Finally, how localized are your prompts? And again, it's just another way of putting a little bit of spin on current and obscure prompts that are highly localized to the teaching moment, the classroom environment, deeply embedded in the course material and teaching content. The, uh, can assess engagement with the material itself, right? Are your prompts assessing actual course activities, course readings, and presentations? I'm going to pick the pace up here a little bit. I want to make sure we have enough time for the rest of, of what we have on the agenda, but just very quickly here, let me just present a four-phase approach to integrating AI technology into course design. Derek's going to give some more specific 
um, active learning uh, ideas uh, that will re relate to this as well. But thinking of this as a, having a front end and a back end um, uh, dimension to it. On the front end of course design or lesson design, set expectations and model and discuss. On the back end, focus on the process when assessing and be prepared uh, to enforce as necessary. Uh, going through these very quickly, under setting expectations, defining, discussing, and illustrating types of academic dishonesty becomes a more urgent priority now than ever before. And laying those out and, and updating our syllabi, but spending significant and meaningful time in class validating these ways of thinking about intellectual content. Um, secondly, selling the value of acquiring independent research and writing skills. Maybe that's a role that we have to get more comfortable with, and that is selling the value of what we are doing in the classroom, what, what those objectives are that we want our students to achieve. And, uh, and you know, I, I think we all probably uh, say something to that effect, but maybe we need to be more skillful in how we approach that question and model that for them. Uh, speaking of modeling and discussing, I'm a big proponent of demonstrating the use of AI tools uh, not staying away from that, but showing that, demonstrating to our students, they need to see that we're literate, uh, uh, you know, in terms of this technology, that we know what we're talking about. And, and that's one of the ways that I think you can uh, sort of uh, anticipate and maybe cut off at the pass some of that potential academic dishonesty when you create a climate where it's okay to talk about technology, it's okay to use it in certain ways. And by the way, the professor knows what, what she's talking about. Secondly, or th uh, under this category, create activities centered on group analysis and re rewriting. Can you use this in a very proactive way to analyze, to explore options, to see what it generates, and then to pick that around and discuss that? Some really uh, productive activities can grow out of that, uh, out of that concept. On the back end, in terms of how do you assess activities, how do you design them and assess them, focus on process. Design assessment activities that unfold in distinct graded benchmark stages. And uh, this is uh, pretty much best practice in writing classes. Uh, but in any class that does have a writing component, history classes, government classes, sociology, psychology classes, even the STEM field that requires various things to be written, um, design these in such a way that process is important. And, uh, and, and this is, again, a way of kind of frustrating the interference of chat GPT. Uh, really, another way of saying this is that you're de-emphasizing the high stakes final product by emphasizing the process itself. This is a beautiful moment, really, where best practices just dovetail with what we should be doing uh, to address chat GPT. So it's kind of a, a perfect union, I think, of objectives here uh, and, a, and, a, and a golden opportunity for us to address these things. Finally, uh, obviously be, re be ready and willing to enforce. And I'm sure you're familiar with the various detection tools are easy to find online if, if you're not uh, familiar with them. In fact, ChatGPT has its own detection tool. And these are pretty impressive in their own way. They're not, they're not foolproof. But uh, again, students will find workarounds. And I think that's uh, something that we just have to recognize. It's very much a cat and mouse process here of, you know, and all technology in a highly competitive arena is going to be like that, right? That, that there's constant adaptation, a uh, symbiotic kind of adaptation, and we can expect that to be the case. Uh, other um, academic uh, inst uh, firms and so on, like Turnitin, are currently expediting their own tools for doing this as well. It's a real mistake, though, to, to think that there's a silver bullet here, just that you can just rely on, at, like kind of a turn it in kind of a thing with plagiarism, and then just you know walk away from it. Uh, that uh, that definitely is not going to be a good strategy going forward for all the reasons that I said. Obviously, we have to be prepared to have conversations, difficult conversations with students about the authenticity of their work. For English professors such as myself, we're kind of tuned into writing style, and we learn to recognize a student's voice. And we can pick up on changes in voice, maybe in a way that's less obvious in other kinds of contexts. But um, with that in mind, I mean, uh, you know, apart from the detection tools, there are going to be maybe obvious things that you can identify that would lead you to have that conversation with a student about their work. But you're likely not to have to get to that point 
as often if you've emphasized process more and if you've designed your activities to be self-rewarding in various ways. Before I close my part of the presentation, I want to just uh, mention that, you know, it's not just text generation. Image generation is something that's really fascinating as well. DALI is, uh, I, I believe, connected with chat GPT. And you can see the, the term there, DALI, and just Google that if you're interested. It's a, it's a sign up. You get some free uh, spins on it, basically. And then you can buy some tokens that will allow you to generate images. Uh, it's been a lot of fun for me to play around with. And I'm actually integrating this into my comparative mythology class. I, I'm just, I love expressionist uh, art, and so I, I told Dali to generate uh, an image of Narcissus. I gave a brief verbal textual uh, um, uh, description of it, and then I told the style I wanted it to be in, or I said I want the Trojan horse in an expressionist style, or Odin and Nigrasil and Icarus and so on, and, and it just immediately gives, or almost immediately gives you th uh, four options, and if you don't like those, you can get four more options. So I decided what a great active learning activity for my students, right? Pick a myth that we've talked about in this last unit and use this algorithm to describe it, you know, enter in a description, pick an art style, anime, whatever, uh, Renaissance, uh, uh, Impressionism, pick a style and generate some options and then explore those, look at them. Which one seems to come closest to kind of capturing the, 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 the resonance, the vibe of that myth for you? And then write a paragraph about you know, why that's the case. How does this really visually express that for you? And it takes you through several different stages of problem solving and thinking and analysis and engagement. And this is basically the prompt that I've generated for that. To produce an AI generated objective is the, uh, is the objective here, uh, an image based on your verbal description. The directions, I'm giving you that, number one. Number two, I tell them what to do. An example, Icarus falling to the sea, anime. Evaluate the four options. Uh, select one and then write a paragraph in which you describe that. Uh, I think this kind of an activity can be widely adapted to many different uh, disciplines and contexts and is a very technology positive way to use uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, as an active learning technique in the classroom. Minimal steps. And this will be my last slide. I'm going to pass it off to Derek here. Update your, these, these are the kind of the, the, I think the the basic things that we should be doing. Update your syllabus to be highly specific and communicate clear expectations to your students. It's not enough just to say that, you know, there's an academic dishonesty policy, right? It covers electronic dishonesty uh, or electronic technology. I think we have to name the technology. I think we have to specifically address it in very, very particular ways and show what the boundary lines are for acceptable and unacceptable use. Familiarize yourself with the technology, as I've been emphasizing, and stay current with new developments. I think nothing will head this off in a classroom more than for students to recognize there is a somewhat technology savvy professor in front of the classroom who knows what they're talking about when they discuss these ideas. Beta test your prompts through ChatGPT. If you haven't done that already, be ruthless and go through them and then revise as necessary based on the guidelines that I provided. And then implement small but consequential changes to course activities and assessments. Again, this is where active learning becomes so critical and so valuable. And then finally, use active learning techniques that engage AI in meaningful ways. I've tried to model that in what I've just shared with you. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the screen right now. And Derek, I'm gonna pass it off to you to Unmute yourself. My colleague, Derek Snyder, uh, teaches out in Hawaii. I'll let him introduce himself more fully, but a colleague, fellow uh, English professor. Derek, go ahead. Thank you so much, Michael. And uh, I just so much appreciate everybody's time. It's very humbling and it's an honor to, to be presenting as part of this panel and the webinar and also to be a part of Lumen Circles. I, I teach at the University of Hawaii on the island of Maui. We are a hybrid university, so we teach a lot of two-year programs as well as four-year programs, and I'm in the English department. And so I just really appreciate the opportunity a lot of times to talk about teaching with other teachers. And I think that's what Lumen Circles provides uh, for me as a facilitator to be able to call time out and to examine some of our lesson plans and think about small changes we could make to encourage more active learning, to really look at evidence-based uh, approaches to our classes. So I'm gonna share my screen. I just wanna walk through some considerations uh, for AI. So it's definitely a hot topic for my department at my college. And so one of the things that I think is very important for me, I've always been a, a teacher who 
uh, wants to try out new things. I teach in all different modalities. Uh, technology is something I utilize quite a bit in my class. At the same time, I recognize that a lot of my students are coming into my classroom uh, underprepared for success in college. So I try to make sure that my students are well supported. Uh, very importantly as well, thinking about how do I incorporate distance elements into all of my classes. And so I would have said this before the pandemic that we are all distance teachers. And actually when I did present on building learning communities, I talked about the fact that in my face-to-face -face classes, I feel like if I bring my distance elements in there that I have superpowers. I'm no longer restricted by the four walls or the, the clock on the wall. And I can really uh, allow for more dynamic, interactive, uh, engaging ways to have student to student interaction, content to student, student to teacher. So it's this paradigm shift. And I really wanna put this AI shift into the bigger context of us in higher education we're really thinking about what is our role anymore? Because anything that I can reveal to the students, they can Google, right? I, I'm not really necessarily giving them any factual knowledge that they can't find on their own. So what is my role then as a teacher? My role is really to be a facilitator of critical thinking. I often think of myself as a writing teacher, not so much as an English teacher. And I think of writing as a thinking endeavor. So I think of myself as a thinking teacher. My objective is to get my students to be better critical thinkers, better problem solvers, future change agents in the community. Uh, and so we think about the paradigm shift that's happened in the classroom. It's really about, in a way, helping students to take a deeper dive into whatever content area they are in. So this is also the paradigm shift that we need with writing instruction. This is something that Michael had um, discussed in the fact that it's a heavy emphasis on process. And so for many years, writing across the disciplines and reading across the discipline, something that I've been an active member of uh, in my own college. And why that's important is I always promote it to content area teachers outside of English in that you'll end up with better products at the end. You'll end up with the learning objectives uh, more greatly achieved and sometimes with less work for you as the teacher if you allow for more process steps along the way, rather than just saying um, there's a research paper due in this economics class or this history course. And in one month's time, make sure that you send it to me or put it on my desk, you'll oftentimes get first drafts, what students will submit versus what would really be a, uh, a full draft. I tell my students that good writing is really rewriting, that I don't really believe in good or bad writing. I really believe in early drafts and later stage drafts. And so I think AI actually allows us to enter into this discussion in a very rich way. And so one of the things that I'm emphasizing to everybody is just increase scaffolding stages, whether you write, you teach in a writing course or you're teaching uh, another course that allow for students to actually actively participate in staged scaffolded steps in the writing process. And I think what that allows for students to do is to understand that, again, good writing is really rewriting. And so to be a good writer is to be a very good critical reader of your own work as well as other people's work. So a lot of time spent workshopping in my courses is examining other works whether there are student samples or other works that are um, published in other arenas. And we talk about it. What's, what's working in these pieces? What's not working in these pieces? And, and how would that relate back to your current draft? And so I think that increase in scaffolding is highly important. The other thing too is these individualized conferences. This is something I do um, outside of office hours. So office hours, I really believe are kind of a little bit of a a model that doesn't work. And so I've moved away from expecting my students to come visit me during my office hours and I have proactive outreach opportunities. So I meet with my students on the regular individually. This is a really rich opportunity for you to have these discussions about student work. And as Michael said, you really get to know your students' voice in this way because you see their early struggles in their drafts. You see their idea formation. You work with them in the different stages. Sometimes it's just for five minutes. Sometimes it's 10 minutes. Zoom has really allowed for that to happen very efficiently. And so there's are different things that you can do. But I think meeting with your students, um, again, leans into just best practices overall. Also, the student discussions. One of the things that Michael mentioned is that in my advanced research writing course this week, for example, in my online discussion board, I shared with students what ChatGPT was in a video. Uh, I shared an article with them and I had them discuss what do they think the role of ChatGPT might be in academic research? What are the concerns about ChatGPT in academic research? So I think that can really entice students to think more deeply about it and become aware of it and really 
uh, struggle a little bit as well with, uh, you know, what are the opportunities versus the challenges and put it into the students court. And, and I think that you'll actually get really rich discussions in class. The other thing too is revising your exam approaches. I think for distance teachers, we've shifted away from the idea of traditional exams long ago because we realized that students can just find the answers. So asking your students to do higher order thinking, asking your students to do things that are a little bit more novel or unique rather than having a closed test that's easy to score, but also easy to get the answers for. I think it does put a little bit more burden on the teacher, but in the end, I think it does require higher order thinking for students. And I think for me as a college instructor, that's what I want. I want my students to depart my classes, uh, really good critical thinkers able to tackle whatever uh, next courses they might encounter. And so the other thing too is the last part is the use of AI as part of the writing lesson. I think this is a really important opportunity. And so I have put some prompts through ChatGPT. And as Michael talked about, you can see that where it does a pretty good job of being fluent and it does hit some of the points of criteria for the writing assignments, but it does lack that kind of human aspect. And there are things in there that really are needed to be revised. But I think it's an activity that you could turn over to the students to say, let's take a look at this chat GPT generated essay. And let's talk about what are the qualities that mirror good writing? What are some things happening in this chat GPT essay that don't mirror good writing? And so I think that's a really good discussion for students to have. And that really is the end goal for us as writing teachers is to think about students understanding one, that writing is a process and that process does involve a little bit of struggle. And two is that when you think about just writing in general, it's really about, um, you know, understanding what are the universal best characteristics of writing. So it doesn't matter if you have to write something for your next class or write something for your professional life or just write something to uh, your partner that you are able to do that effectively. And so I think that it is an opportunity for us to actually use chat, chat GPT in this way. At the same time, letting students know that that early struggle of first draft is a huge part of successfully writing as well, that it's not something they should try to avoid, but something they should lean into as well. But again, it really, if you have that environment in your classroom where you are welcoming that struggle and being right there side by side with your students in that struggle, then it really helps students to embrace it more. And so I, I'll leave just with this kind of slide, the opportunities versus the challenges, because I realize it's not unique only to say, for example, the writing world or to the English world, it's unique to, it's not unique, it's everywhere in all the different departments and across our different campuses. I'll say one final thing. I know when Turnitin first came out, a lot of teachers wanted to use it as that gotcha opportunity at the end, say they had a paper and a student handed it in. My suggestion for Turnitin at that time was to say to faculty members, use it as a part of the toolbox for the students. So early drafts, they could actually turn in their own essays to turn it in see what's coming back and see that maybe they do have a high percentage of plagiarism early on. So they need to go back and figure out how to avoid that. And so it actually became something they had as an advantage versus something that was a disadvantage for the teacher. And so I just think, you know, with AI, there's opportunities for that as well. I don't profess to have it figured out. I'm certainly not an expert in it, but I do think that it's something that is here, whether in the form of chat, chat GPT or the next, you know, iteration or the next um, platform that will put it forward, that it's going to be something that we're going to be working with uh, for the years to come. So something that we should definitely lean into. I'm going to pass it off to Nicole because she's in the STEM field. And so she can talk a little bit more about what are some of the opportunities and challenges that are outside of the English realm. Thank you, Derek. Um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, Nicole Simon from Nassau Community College, which is part of the State University system of New York. I teach in the STEM fields and at community college. So I have a slightly different perspective in taking a look at chat GBT. Um, I also have a different perspective as a Lumen facilitator because I welcome the active learning process. I welcome the ability to, to share with colleagues their thoughts and their perspectives. More importantly, what our students are bringing to us. When we think of academic integrity or any use of AI pre-trained transitional software it really puts into question the, the human semantic knowledge. More importantly, are we challenged by technology and how can we challenge technology? I find that the AI systems really don't represent critical thinking and creativity or problem solving. And these are all areas that are critical to STEM education. 
It also doesn't encompass assumptions very well, especially in the STEM areas. It doesn't allow for diagrams or equations to be analyzed properly. And it's the easiest way to get around this is to assign the atypical type questions and problem sets. But more on a positive side, how can we use AI-assisted technologies such as ChatGTP for helping to do data analysis or perform algorithms for students? This kind of expedites some of the process and allows for students to say, okay, let me take a step back and learn from what's going on with the technology and to say, you know what, this is not right getting data analysis in a certain aspect or take that humanist approach to it of what are we learning from and how can we do a deeper dive or higher order thinking of our data analysis. But more importantly, some of the drawbacks are for neurodiverse students who really need that one-on-one -on -one human interaction. So I took a look at how I could really use this in my courses and across the board in all STEM. When we think about scaffolding our information, when we think about chunking out what it is that students are doing, if you take a look at just the simple lab report, do I have a problem with a student using AI-assisted software to come up with the introduction or the procedure? No, I don't, because I want them to understand the analysis. And from the flip side, what happens if they were to use ChatGBT to do their data analysis? Well, I work in a field and I teach in a field of the, but why? But why did this happen? But why did we do this? But there's always that why aspect to have them dig deeper. Having them use it for a problem set, it, did it teach them? Not necessarily, but there's always that expectation of, yes, the aha, I got you portion of using any of the AI assisted technology. But more importantly, once you've done that, Let's take a step back and say, let's not use it for assessment purposes. Let's not use it for the I got you, the aha moment. We want to be able to take that learning process. We want to be able to take the student who used the assistive technology to come up with their problem and then drill deeper. What did you learn? What are your pain points? How can you really design assessments properly in any field where students are learning from the learning process itself? We want them to understand the information. We want to scaffold our teaching and their learning so that they can build on this knowledge. Are they going to use this? Absolutely. How can we best help them and support them so that they are using it in a positive aspect? They're using it for a writing prompt. They are using it to build on knowledge that they're doing for maybe a lab portion or for problem sets. Go back and say, here's the information you've done. Pretty much know it's going to be through AI technology but drill deeper into what have you learned from it, or more importantly, what can we use this as a prompt to go to the next level of learning? I want to save a little bit of time because I know there are some questions that are popping up. Yes, are, are we ready to answer the um, Q&A? Sure. Yes. All right. Um, so one of our questions is ChatGBT similar or have components to AI decision support systems in healthcare? I don't have any specific knowledge about that myself. Uh, do either of you, Nick or Derek? I mean, the basic the basic underlying structure uh, of uh, AI technology it's based upon. Uh, the, the deep learning of the brain's functions. I mean, it's, it's a function of the explosion of neuroscience, basically, in the study and the mapping of the brain. And that's really what's driving, and in, in every application of AI, what's driving it. So, uh, yeah, but I'd have to have more specifics to be able to, to say anything more to that. Yeah, I don't have any specifics about that. I know on my campus that we kind of entered into this larger conversation in our academic senate and I think that's really something that I would encourage every campus to do is really talk about this topic across disciplines, because I think the way that it's going to manifest itself will be different in the healthcare field than it will be in other fields. And so I think when you can bring everybody into that table, those rich discussions, um, I think that universities and colleges have a really important role um, in trying to guide, uh, you know, some of the directions of these things. And John Walters just pointed out in chat that uh, AI technology is being used in, in many uh, uh, health settings. And I think we've seen those reports and everything. So yeah, it's, it's definitely impacting and transforming every, every domain basically of life. 
um, the next question, and you guys might not know this one, is there a specific algorithm common used by, commonly used by AI? It's a very technical question, and I that would be way beyond my my technical <laughs> knowledge. I actually um, part of my background, a significant part of my doctoral work was in linguistics, and for a while I uh, did some gig work uh, as a uh, linguistic annotator. Uh, on projects as part of the team and working remotely. And I we knew that we were working through a third party vendor, but we were working for big tech Silicon Valley companies, Google and Facebook and so on and so forth. And it was fascinating because working as a linguist on, you know, seeing what I saw, doing very detailed syntactic analyses and so on. We were training uh, AI algorithms in doing that. And so I've seen I've seen that portion of it, but then somebody with that uh, programming knowledge is going to obviously take that and work with that. And that that is well beyond uh, my knowledge level. Okay. And then this one is specifically for you, Michael, is do you have your students write reflections on how they created prompts and revise them so that they share what they learned using chat GBT in the writing process? I haven't specifically done that, but I, I like that variation. It kind of builds a little bit upon what Derek was sharing as well to be just more interactive with this process, right? And, uh, and 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 to to be transparent about it as well. I think that there's uh, really no downside to that approach. And so whether it's in, in my presentation of material and my engagement and modeling of the technology and the way that I have revised prompts and so on and so forth, or having them reflect upon those things in their own interaction, I think there's a real payoff uh, uh, from a, just a learning standpoint in doing that. I'd say too, uh, one of the things in Lumen Circles we focus in on is the theme of belonging and a big part of the belonging theme is pedagogical partnerships, trying to partner with your students. And I think there's an opportunity there for partnership. We start thinking about students generating the prompts or working together with the students to generate the prompts. And, and why that's important is it does require higher order thinking for the students. Um, and so I do think that, again, it's an opportunity for us to maybe ask our students to do more. And I think one of the things that was mentioned in the chat earlier is, does that place an additional burden on the students who already might be struggling? I do think that we have to figure out ways to scaffold it in such a way that it, it, it is something that is manageable and doable for our students. And so it does take a little bit more effort for us as um, teachers, but I think the payoff is incredible. Absolutely. Thank you. And then the next one, we're going to try to get in as many as we can. Um, for another one from Michael, should we be focused on how to create assignments and assessments that be chat GBT, or should we be focused on how to use chat GBT to push students more deeply and intensively into learning? Well, I mean, I'm going to give you the weasel answer, which is both and, you know, I mean, I think we can do both of those things. And it really depends upon the application. It depends upon the activity as well. I mean, I presented a couple of different strategies, one of which was, and I, I don't really like the adversarial approach, and I get where, you know, why that's being framed, how to beat it. But I, that whole cat mouse approach is something that I think has really framed this issue. It's kind of that, as Derek said, that whole turn it in mentality, basically, right? That whole gotcha mentality. And I think that's what we've got to fundamentally change is kind of the mindset, the culture of how we think about that. And so I but but having said that, I think there is wisdom in designing prompts that frustrate. That's the word I would use instead of beating frustrating algorithms uh, to uh, to basically de uh, disincentivize some of the some of the abuses of the technology. But that doesn't get us off the hook. We've got to design the activities that draw students in into the content. And a part of that can be actively using, as Derek said, the technology as a learning tool in the process of writing, in the process of analysis and exploration. Derek, do you or Nick have anything to add to that? Yeah, one of the questions I answered just in, in type was, what about scientific writing? And I think that the same principles apply. I think you could look at something that's chat GPT generated as scientific writing, ask students to look at what are some of the things that are representing best practices in that realm? What are some things that are falling short? Again, I, I think it's that opportunity for us, not necessarily just to look at the product, but to look at, and really the, the learning objectives to shift more to, are the students really taking that deeper dive into what it means to be a good scientific writer versus that heavy emphasis on showing that artifact? And I think sometimes there's a, a kind of a, an over demand on looking at the artifact 
in fact, really the, the richness of the learning experience actually rests in the process. And so sometimes the group work, um, you know, can also be a part of this as well. And I think when you start to get those rich discussions, there's more opportunities for students to work with each other. Absolutely. And it lacks the depth of, of what you're writing. You can absolutely see the lack of, of humanistic approach, that there's, there's no depth to it. But also, students really do need that help where they're talking about your, um, your scientific and your technical writing skills. So maybe it is not such a bad thing that we're kind of using it as a little bit of a prompt or a crutch to help them along from the onset, at least. Well, I think that will be our last question for today because we're at the top of the hour. Thank you everyone that um, was able to join us. We will be sharing a recording and the resources shared by our wonderful panelists today um, in an email and a follow-up email. So please be on the lookout for this and we appreciate everyone that joined us. Um, we will, it will shut off really quickly. So thank you all for, um, from to me and to our panelists and I appreciate everyone that joined us.